Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the interval. Uh, my name is Michael McElligot with the Long Now Foundation. We're so happy to welcome you here to our San Francisco headquarters, the interval. I knew Tim's name before, uh, you know, I, I, knew, uh, I, I knew what he looked like or anything um, from his publishing endeavors. And, you know, just I just wanted to sort of set the tone that, you know, in, in the early 90s, um, on the other side of the coast, uh, on, on the East Coast, um, you know, the William Gibson saying is that the, the future's already here, it's not evenly distributed. Um, as those of us that live in the Bay Area know, um, San Francisco is a place that the future clumps up. And it doesn't get to the middle or the other side of the country or, or, or other countries. Um, it, it, it takes a while to, to do there, to, to get there. and. Um, in the early 90s, pre-web, or the very early days of the web, um, there were uh, channels that we would, we would hear these little broadcasts of the future. Wired Magazine, Mondo, um, The Whole Earth, of course, before, before that. And then these books started showing up on some of my geekier friends' desks with these compelling animal figures on them. And uh, this was another really important uh, message from the future. Uh, really, as new important technologies were coming out, they were being documented. And uh, you know, O'Reilly Media was uh, like the record label of, of these emerging technologies getting released on a regular basis. I wasn't reading most of them. Uh, I was the English major of the, the geeky uh, set. So, um, but. But clearly something was going on there. And when you get to San Francisco, um, it all starts to make more sense of it, maybe. But so just to say that um, Tim has been um, looking for patterns and, and charting uh, the territory of the, uh, the territory we're about to reach for a long time. Um, and with this new book, he's both looking back and looking forward for us, and uh, he's going to share some, I think, uh, really compelling stuff now. So give a big round of applause for Tim. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, it's uh, kind of wonderful to speak with a small group and a little bit informally. I am going to use some slides, but I'm also uh, going to do a reading from the book, uh, which I have not done before. Uh, Michael asked if I would do that, and I thought it would be uh, fun uh, to, do, uh, to, to, to read you a couple of passages. And in some ways, I've used the slides uh, to cue up uh, the passages. So uh, the other thing that really shaped this talk is this illustration, which I will come to. Uh, I wasn't planning. To, uh, I was planning a very different talk, and then when we decided to do this illustration, uh, I said, well, it has to be about the part of the book that relates to the illustration. Even though the illustration does not appear in the book, it deeply shaped my life and my thinking. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of the backstory of that uh, in order to uh, uh, make that clear. So uh, I actually uh, have you know, sort of framed this uh, not just about the book, but about, and particularly about a part of the book, which is about how to think about the future. And it's rooted in the idea that the way we talk about things is actually our map of the world. And just as uh, physical maps can be wrong, the way we talk about the world can lead us astray. And a, a, a lot of what I've done throughout my career in technology has been to look at the maps we're using and say, oh, oh, it's leaving out these things, and to try to tell a different story than what other people were telling. And so uh, you know, back in the you know, early days of the free software movement, I was like, why aren't you guys talking about the internet? Why are you just talking about Linux? You know, and it was just there was this, this map that was the political story about free software that overwhelmed looking at the entire world and saying, well, well there's all these really interesting free software programs. And some of them are actually even more successful than Linux. And why, we have to have a story that explains all of them. And that's what led me to you know, do the activism that I did about open source software. And similarly, after the dot-com bust, we were able to say, well, there's a lot of companies 
that survived, what distinguished them? And how do we tell the story about what that was? And that was the Web 2.0 movement. But what I've been focused on uh, you know, over the last uh, four or five years has been thinking about technology and the economy. And in particular, uh, you know, I've been thinking about what the great technology platforms of today teach us about business and the future of the economy. Because it seems to me that you know, Google and Amazon and Facebook in some ways are economies themselves. And their rise and their fall, their successes and their failures, and the techniques that they're using to manage their economies actually teach us a lot about the economy as a whole. They also teach us something about the rise of a new kind of platform capitalism, where we're building these platforms that aggregate work in new ways, that aggregate demand in new ways, uh, that are very different than the old markets of supply and demand coordinated by price uh, alone. You know, think, for example, about Google's ad auction. They, they, they came up with other signals besides, pr besides price that actually said, no, no, this is the best ad. You know, there's a lot of really interesting stuff happening uh, in the world of tech. But I was really focused in particular on you know, how when they become extractive, they tend to fail. But that's not what I'm going to talk about tonight because of this diagram. What I'm really going to talk about is the, the first part of the book, which really explains uh, a lot of the techniques that I've tried to use uh, to build stories, to tell stories, to see the world, and in some sense to draw the maps that I have then uh, worked from. And I also want to talk a little bit about how to make better choices. But let me start really with this sort of notion of the entrepreneur as uh, the explorer. You know, we guys, we've all been pretty excited recently to see, uh, at least if you're like me, you know, you grew up uh, you know, with this science fiction vision of spaceships that, you know, rockets took off and then they landed. And then, you know, you know but we, we had lived for 40 years where they took off and then they just dropped in the ocean with a parachute. What was wrong with that picture? And suddenly, you know, we're doing it. And technology changed, but it was also the, the, the willingness to think a little bit differently. Uh, similarly, 2005, you know, we had connected taxi cabs and they looked like that. It's like, we knew what you did with the internet. You put a screen, you know, <laughs> somewhere and you showed ads and you showed news. And so 2005, the connected taxi cab was the internet in the back of the taxi cab. And right now we're having this idea that, you know, robots are going to put everybody out of work. And yet, the evidence is that this is wrong, but bad maps persist. You know, back in uh, 1625, there was a map done of California that showed it as an island, and that map persisted as the accepted knowledge, the wisdom. There actually were expeditions that took boats to the Mojave Desert because there was this great passage, the, the, the Gulf of, of, you know, I mean, the... Uh, See if Cortez went all the way up to Canada, right? No, it didn't. But we had a map that persisted for 100 years that told people that that was true. And that's really, you know, what happened here was Elon Musk rewrote the map. You know, Jeff Bezos is working also rewriting the map. You know, we really came to understand that the connected taxi cab was not a screen in the back of the cab. It was this new you know, combination of humans and machines into this vast network, you know, where, where people are being dispatched by algorithm. It's this incredible rethinking of the capabilities that are given to us by the smartphone with sensors, where all of a sudden you know where everybody is. And you go, wow, we can do coordination at scale in a very different way. And so there was this new rediscovery, this rethinking, this rewriting of the map that took us from that 2005, we're going to show you uh, ads in the back of the taxi cab, to, well, you can just pull out your phone and summon a car to wherever you are, and there'll be this swarming mass of drivers, more of them when, when you need them, fewer of them when you don't. Uh, you know, a lot to work out still, but boy, we're rewriting that map big time. Similarly, on the, the robots and jobs, 
You know, here's, uh, here's Amazon, uh, 2014 to 2016, put 45,000 robots into their warehouses and hired 250,000 people. You know, yet we're still talking about the robots are gonna take all our jobs. And I just had a conversation this morning with Hal Varian, uh, Google's chief economist, and he has a talk he's working on which he calls uh, Bots and Tots. Uh, and it's basically about uh, this idea of robots and jobs. And he's like, look, the one thing we know for sure, he said, there's only one social science that can predict the future, and it's demographics. You know, and we actually look at demographics, and the supply of labor is going to be going down, down, down you know, in the absence of, of immigration. You know, so we're actually not running out of jobs. We're running out of workers. You know, and yet the bad map persists. And we also have the example of someone like Amazon saying, no, no, we're actually going to, you know, we're, we're not going to do the same thing more cheaply with robots. We're going to start delivering uh, same day. You know, and of course, then they put lots of people to work. So rewriting the map is the central entrepreneurial act. But it's also something that we have to do for our society. And that's really the polemic part of the book, because I'm really trying to get people thinking about what do we have to do to redraw the map in such a way that we don't just do it the way we've always done it. There's so many possibilities. You know, if in fact the robots can do more of the work, why do we have to organize society the same way? And I want to come to that, back to that a little bit later. So anyway, great entrepreneurs see the world with fresh eyes, and they get out of a certain kind of framing blindness that so often uh, you know, gets us kind of just seeing the world the way that we always accepted it. So now we come to this diagram. Uh, this uh, is a, a, a drawing from a kind of crazy book from the 1920s called uh, Science and Sanity by Alfred Korzybski. And it's called The Structural Differential. He actually patented it. It was a training device to help you understand uh, something that he wrote in Science and Sanity, that the map is not the territory. So the idea of it is there's this, yeah, actually, I made one when I was a teenager, you know, after reading the book, you know, and you're supposed to basically, as you've talked, as you've thought, you're supposed to finger this device to understand where you were in the process of abstraction. Because what it is is a diagram of the process by which we turn the stuff of reality into the stuff inside our head. So the idea was that big thing at the top was a representation of a parabola. That is, reality is infinite. You know, there's, there's just so much there. The circle represents the experience of an individual human of that infinite reality that we're all looking at. And the strings that come from the infinite reality to the individual experience represent the fact that we abstract only part of what we see, of what we hear. Right? And so, for example, um, and the, and, and the fact that there's multiple circles indicates that each of us doesn't even experience the same thing. And it's even as small, it's as small as the fact that one person is looking at me from over there, someone else is looking at me from over there, uh, but it also could be that we have different visual acuity. That anybody in the room is colorblind? No? Uh, but there are people who are, you know, this all, you know, so you would see my shirt differently. So th this whole idea that there's this big difference between the reality and the experience of it. And then you get into the labeling, the abstraction. And Korzybski's point in Science and Sanity is there's so many places where we go wrong because we get stuck in the labels. And you actually think with labels. That's why we do it. You know, we, we have these abstractions, which are these convenient ways for us not to have to notice anymore. You know? And so his idea here was this device, you would look at it and you go, okay, well, I, I, I'm actually, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not actually looking at the thing, I'm just using the convenient word for it, so let me go back and look at it. And, and there was a, so anyway, I got into all this as a result of some work I did in the 70s in San Francisco growing up with a guy named George Simon, who uh, it, it was using it as a sort of a, a gateway drug to nonverbal communication and, and sort of expanded perception. And it really amazing, you, you can actually train yourself to notice where you are. Are you actually looking? 
Are you actually taking in? You can, how can I sit with something and take in more of it? You know, connect more of those strings. And it's sort of an experiential practice, just like you have meditation. But I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. What I want to really talk about a little bit is, uh, again, maps. OK, here we are, Fort Mason. Oh, wait, here we are, Fort Mason. Uh, you know, here we are, Fort Mason. Wait a minute. Something a little odd about this map, right? Because if you're like me, you, when you think about the Bay Area from a distance, you think about it like that, don't you? You know, because we're so used to that north-south orientation that we actually think it's part of the reality. We don't realize that that north-south orientation is something that happens down here, right? And there's a lot of things like that in our experience. And if we go back, you know, and you go, wow, what else do you see when you actually look at it a little bit differently. You know, like one of the things I found really interesting when I, the reason I chose this, I, like I tend to think San Francisco goes north-south. And you don't really notice because of that sort of filter blindness that the north-south orientation of San Francisco is actually not echoed by a north-south orientation in Marin. Marin goes way out to the west. You know, and so, but, but as soon as you, sorry, uh, you go to the, you know, you flip the orientation, you can really see, wow, it's not straight up and down at all. You know, it's just, so that kind of filter blindness, there's a lot of exercises you can do to train yourself to go, oh, look. Anyway, so the thing that's really critical is, you know, uh, you know noticing what's left out of the map, you know. And, you know, for me, a lot of that was, there was a map of innovation that was about, you know, venture capitalists and uh, entrepreneurs. And I had a map that said, no, no, actually, look at these weird alpha geeks, as I call them, people who are just doing technology for fun. And uh, how do you, what are they interested in? You know, so back when uh, everybody thought all the money was to be made uh, in, uh, you know, in the, on the PC, you know, these people who were going, well, there's this thing with the internet, there's this thing with open source software. Uh, so we have these sort of periods where we can, learn by looking at different kinds of people. But I also you know, wanted to talk about another way that you can kind of catch the future, and that's with a metaphor. You know, there's this wonderful thing that poets do, which is that they help us to express the inexpressible and to capture things that we don't yet fully understand. You know, when we're back in this diagram, they help us say, well, yeah, there's this thing that's infinite. You know, as, as Blake said, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everyone would see uh, things as they are, infinite, or see reality as it is, infinite. You know, uh, you know, we're stuck in this tiny selection from what's, what's really there. And poetry can be a wonderful way of pointing to that. So anyway, I actually was very happy to be able to put a little bit of poetry in my book. Uh, uh, because uh, I, I, it's, to me, it's something I truly love. Uh, but anyway, so I, I'm, I'm talking in, in this particular passage. The book, just to be clear, is it's a combination of a memoir, a business book, and, and a sort of economic call to action, a, you know, a, a polemic, if you like, about what we need to do differently. But uh, I was talking a little bit about uh, this history by which I went from describing the internet as an operating system you know, that people, again, it was, it was now everybody kind of gets it, your cloud computing and so on, but it was this new idea at the time, uh, to actually using a metaphor of the internet as the global brain. And in fact, I did a talk for long now called Towards the Global Brain, which is about that. But uh, here, I, uh, uh, starting on page 41, the notion of the internet as an operating system for the next generation of applications had taken me a long way. By 2010, the idea had, by the way, I started talking about that in about 2000, so it was about nine years of, of pushing that. By 2010, the idea had taken hold in the industry. Developers were routinely writing applications that relied on data from internet services, about location, search results, social networks, music, products, and so much more. Startups were no longer building local applications in their own data centers, but rather what is now called the cloud. I didn't need to keep preaching that gospel. And frankly, I was ready to move on. As T.S. Eliot so memorably put it, 
One has only learnt to get the better of words for the thing one no longer has to say, or the way in which one is no longer disposed to say it. And so each venture is a new beginning, a raid on the inarticulate. Actually, I wanted to read you a little bit more than that uh, uh, from that wonderful passage from East Coker, which I, beyond what I put in the book. Uh, uh, t two passages, just for, for context. He says, there, there is, it seems to us, at best, only a limited value in the knowledge derived from experience. The knowledge imposes a pattern and falsifies. For the pattern is new in every moment, and every moment is a new and shocking valuation of all we have been. We are only undeceived of that which deceiving could no longer harm. So here I am in the middle way, having had 20 years, 20 years largely wasted, trying to use words, and every attempt is a wholly new start and a different kind of failure. This is where I pick up the piece in the book. Because one has only learnt to get the better of words for the thing one no longer has to say, or the way in which one is no longer disposed to say it. And so each venture is a new beginning, a raid on the inarticulate, with shabby equipment always deteriorating in the general mess of imprecision of feeling, undis undisciplined squads of emotion. And of course, uh, uh, but that is what you know poetry does, is actually to, to give you this uh, wonderful set of images. So I had started to use this image of the global brain. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I, I kind of particularly focused on it with, with Twitter. But anyway, I, uh, I also, uh, <laughs> uh, let me fin finish reading this before I, before I, I, I move on. Uh, so uh, increasingly, I've been watching a kind of Cambrian explosion in applications for collective intelligence that were qualitatively different from those of the desktop web. Smartphones had put a camera in everyone's hand, and Twitter had created a real-time platform from which those photos and text updates could be instantly disseminated to the world. Billions of connected humans and devices were being woven into a global brain. That brain was all of us, augmented and connected. And then later on in the book, I, I pick up this, this thread again. And, uh, and, and, and this is where I'm talking about AI. And I say, when we imagine an artificial intelligence, we assume it will have an individual self, an individual consciousness, just like us. And this is one of our maps, our implicit maps. What if instead an AI were more like a multicellular organism, an evolution beyond our single-celled selves? What's more, what if we were not even the cells of such an organism, but its microbiome, the vast ecology of microorganisms that inhabits our bodies? This notion is at best a metaphor, but I believe it is a useful one. As the internet speeds up the connection between human minds, as our collective knowledge, memory, and sensations are shared and stored in digital form, we are weaving a new kind of technology-mediated superorganism, a global brain consisting of all connected humans. This global brain is a human-machine hybrid. The senses of that global brain are the cameras, microphones, keyboards, and location sensors of every computer, smartphone, and Internet of Things device. The thoughts of that global brain are the collective output of billions of individual contributing intelligences, shaped, guided, and amplified by algorithms. Digital services like Google, Facebook, and Twitter that connect hundreds of millions or even billions of people in near real time are already primitive hybrid AIs. The fact that the intelligence of these systems is interdependent with the intelligence of the community of humans that make it up is an echo of the way that we ourselves function. Each of us is a vast nation of trillions of differentiated cells, only some of which share our own DNA, while far more are immigrants. The vast microbiome of microorganisms that colonize our guts, our skin, our circulatory systems. There are far more microorganisms in our bodies than there are human cells. Not invaders, but a functioning part of the whole. Without the microorganisms we host, we could not digest our food or turn it into useful energy. The bacteria in our guts have even been shown to change how we think and how we feel. 
A multicellular organism is the sum of the communications, the ecosystem, the platform or marketplace, if you will, of all its participants. And when that marketplace gets out of balance, we fall ill or fail to live up to our potential. Humans are living in the guts of an AI that is only now being born. Perhaps like us, the global AI will not be an independent entity, but a symbiosis with the human consciousnesses living within it and alongside it. Um, so um, I kind of go from there to thinking about how this applies to our algorithmic systems and how they're changing the nature of the relationship between humans and machines and, and how they're changing the nature of our, our financial markets. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but just there's lots about that in the book. Uh, but I want to kind of move on to continue to talk about this. How, you know, what tools can you use to think about the future? And I just, I, I look all the time, somebody says something and it helps me see the world in a new way. You know, uh, Michael earlier quoted William Gibson's uh, wonderful quote, uh, the future is here, uh, it's just not evenly distributed yet. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure I, I should really, uh, I correctly take credit for it. I read that in a magazine somewhere and I think I'm the person who made that famous because I used it so many, for so many years in so many speeches. You know, it was just something I picked up out of a magazine because it's like, yeah, that's true. You know, and I think about these other ones. Edmund Schlossberg said, you yeah, know, the skill of writing is to create a context in which other people can think. You know, Ray Kurzweil once said, an invention has to make sense in the world in which it is finished, not the world in which it is started. These are like incredible tools. You know, like somebody says something, you, know, like you go, wow, yeah, I'm going to look for that. I'm going to see it. It's just like this little lens. You know, because that's the thing that you can do. You can pick up this little label and then you can kind of use it to kind of go back up the chain uh, and see. Now, there's one that I just, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that Michael asked me to do is to talk about stuff that's not in the book, but that's like the continuation. And here's one of the things, um, is, is my next slide. Uh, there's a wonderful book called The Divine Right of Capital, which is not in the book because I didn't know about it. But I actually used a metaphor uh, late in the book, I, I wrote, you know, uh, you know, future economic historians uh, will look back, you know, wryly on this period in which, uh, so, something like, I should have found, found it in the book and read it. Uh, we'll look back wryly on this period in which we look down on our ancestors for believing in the divine right of kings while we believe in the divine right of capital. And so one of, one of my readers sent me an email saying, uh, you know, are you familiar with Marjorie Kelly's book, The Divine Right of Capital? And one of the things that she wrote in there, which I just never really even thought about, I just took for granted, she said, look, our financial statements tell us how to think about, you know, relationship between businesses and their workers. Encoded in financial statements, you know, this, we, we kind of go, okay, yeah, the profit is the revenue minus the costs, right? But then they, that got restated somehow that, that that's actually capital income, revenue minus employee income. Because actually the income to a business is employee, is, is income to the people who work there and the people who made investments. But we ended up defining the bottom line as the return to capital. She says, look, you could just as easily say there is a way that you organize businesses where the return, you know, the bottom line is the return to the workers and capital is an input that you consider a cost. And it was just such a really interesting kind of reframing of the map that's embodied in our financial statements that we take, again, going back to this, we take a financial statement as somehow a representation of reality when in fact it's a particular description you know, and she kind of goes in at length about the divine right of kings, you know, where for, you know, it's really, you know, for a thousand years, there was this idea that certain people were closer to God. And they actually, as a result of being closer to God, they owned more stuff, and they were supposed to own more stuff. And she kind of goes off on this wonderful thing about, uh, you know, this uh, uh, book of the peerage, you know, where it's sort of like literally the hierarchy of people in the universe and who deserves the most, you know, it's like and it goes from the king and then there's the Prince of Wales and then there's, you know, on down through all the, you know, down to the lower barons and then there's the ordinary people. And, 
And uh, it's sort of interesting. She says, well, now we have you know, the Forbes 400, whatever. You know? And uh, it, it, it's a really interesting, just little example of somebody throwing out an idea. And then you go, wow, yeah, I can see the world in a whole new way. So um, what am I doing on time here? I think I'm running a little long. Um, so the other thing that I found really useful as a tool for thinking about the future is to think in vectors. You know, a vector is uh, you know, a, basically a, a quantity and a direction. And you know, so in, in, in terms of our sort of experience or thinking about the future, take demographics. You know, there's, there's a direction and a quantity. There are going to be, we know that there are more people you know, being born, growing up in different countries. You know, demographics is destiny. This is a vector there. Moore's law for many years was a knowable vector. And you can start to think about these things and start to theorize about the future based on a map that's really not a map of what is, but a map of here's what we know about the present that might tell us something about the future. And of course, there's a discipline. And here, Lawrence uh, is sitting right in the front, and Stuart's uh, deep, deeply in there. Discipline uh, that was uh, you know, designed specifically around this idea of how do you use vectors as a way of thinking about possible influences on the future, and then actually start to, to theorize about what that might be. And in the book, I actually do, a, 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 just as a way of introducing scenario planning, uh, which, uh, which I wrote about by shamelessly uh, you know, ripping off uh, Lawrence's uh, uh, you know, uh, explication of it to me when he did a scenario planning exercise with my company many years ago. Uh, but I, I, uh, I kind of, you know, you can kind of understand, you know, if we, if we think about climate change, there's, there's a, a possibility that, you know, there's not much to it. You know, the Republicans certainly don't think there is, right? So well, let's just assume that that's a, a real possibility. And over there, you know, but then there's also the possibility that's like, holy shit, it's really bad. You know, and then there's the, how do we respond? That's also a vector. We get, we're going to possibly re respond very slowly. We're going to respond very fast. And then you kind of, you build this a bunch of scenarios and you say, okay, well, if the problem is fast and big and the response is fast and big, you know, there's a possibility. Technology saves the day. This is the Silicon Valley narrative, right? Uh, this also, uh, the problem is non-existent. What happens? Well, actually, Elon Musk is still doing pretty well, because we all like our electric cars, even if we, it was no climate change. So that's your innovation premium scenario, right? And uh, you know, on the other hand, we don't do anything. There's no, no problem. We got business as usual. Not terribly interesting, not a lot of opportunity. <laughs> on the other hand, we have slow, non-existent response and a big problem. Oh my god, societal collapse. Really bad news, right? So the key concept of scenario planning is that you're looking for a robust strategy. That is something that you would want to do in any circumstance. And of course, this reminds me of Pascal's wager, uh, which was uh, you know, the, the, the mathematician Blaise Pascal, who basically made an argument for why it's better to believe in God, even if you don't know whether it's true or not. Now, this was the medieval. Uh, not medieval, but uh, you know, Renaissance uh, uh, version. But this is the 21st century equivalent. You know, it makes sense to deal with climate change. So I, I did a similar exercise then for what I'm calling uh, you know, AI robots and the next economy. You know, sort of like we have this possibility of machines doing all of the work, or actually machines actually being enablers for new kinds of work, which is, of course, what always happened before. You know, we didn't actually just do the same things. We got to do new things. You know, we didn't used to fly through the air. You know, and then magically we get to fly through the air. You know, so, and, and that created tourism at a different scale and so on. So, and then there's this other vector, which is optimizing for just the owners of the machines or optimizing for everyone. And again, the question that I ask and I try to address in the book is what is the robust strategy? And the robust strategy is and I love this uh, quote, the people will rise up before the machines do, which is what happens if we basically machines do all the work and the, the owners of the machines get all the benefit is, uh, as Andy McAfee said to me, uh, the people will rise up before the robots do. Uh, 
But there's also, you could also have the situation even when there's magical new kinds of work, if we optimize only for the owners of the machines, we end up going, well, we're all getting screwed. You know, it's like it's, the world is amazing, but we're not getting the benefit of it. And to me, what I call the WTF of astonishment is we're continuing, you know, hey, oh my God, we're bringing extinct species back to life, right? <laughs> You know, isn't this awesome? And we're using it to rebuild the world. Uh, you know, we're, we're helping ourselves to adapt to climate change, for example. That's the WTF of astonishment, where we're optimizing for everyone and where technology is enabling new kinds of work. But, you know, hey, you know, even if the machines do all the work, there's a future of creative abundance, where there's, everybody's hanging out at places like the interval, right? <laughs> so anyway, I kind of go, so the robust strategy pretty clearly is optimized for everyone, uh, and, and, and I, think, I actually think enabling new kinds of work is, in fact, the really interesting, you know, robust future. So I think I'm going to stop there. I have a bunch of other, you know, parts of where I've kind of unpacked some of the maps that I kind of try to describe in the book. But I'd like to have time to interact with all, all of you. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Let's a big round of applause for Tim. Thanks, Tim. So uh, think, of, uh, think of your questions. Uh, Rio's going to be walking around with a mic. Um, Tim, I've got a couple uh, uh, things to get you started. Um, this is great. Uh, and the book is wonderful. Um, what's really interesting, an interesting aspect of the book, um, you can really see the textbook writer in you, because there are these little call-outs periodically. Uh -huh. and, 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 and like, really, just as you were telling us about um, wanting to communicate how to think about the future and how to read the future. Yeah. It's not someone who's just saying, um, this is the way it's going to be. Mm -hmm. You're giving your analysis, but you're also giving little tips. They're, they're just little right. of these call outs. Right, I open one. Simple decentralized systems work better at generating new possibilities than centralized complex systems because they're able to evolve more quickly. Each decentralized component within the overall framework of simple rules is able to seek out its own fitness function. Those components that work better reproduce and spread, those that don't die off. And, and, and so it's really this trajectory that dates yeah. back, you know, yeah. to, and, and, you know, the textbook industry, it seems, is something you got into really kind of accidentally, but it, it seems like, can you say something about you, and I guess it, it fits with the mission of, um, of the company as well, how you think about technology and enabling other people, the, the teaching of it, the, the, the work that you do in terms of sharing, not just what's going on, but the yeah. how to, the maker aspect, really, of, of, well, of everything. You know, I guess very early on, uh, I asked myself, you know, what did we really do at my company? So just so you understand, O'Reilly Media started out as a tech writing consulting firm, then we became a computer book publisher, then we started running technology conferences. Uh, we started an online uh, ebook platform, which evolved into an online learning platform, uh, which is really the heart of the business today. But we realized, uh, actually, in some work that we did with, with, with Lawrence, um, the, um, Lawrence Wilkinson, who's sitting here in the front row, uh, you know, we, we really started asking ourselves a lot about w who do we want to be overall. And, in this sort of period of investigation, we really started to think of ourselves as a technology transfer company at, at heart, that our, our business was fundamentally changing the world by spreading the knowledge of innovators. And uh, we've tried to, you know, live by that ever since. And uh, our, our, you know, our, our sort of, our motto at the company is create more value than you capture, which came out of a, 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 a management retreat, again, about that time, about 2000. Uh, when I was telling the story to uh, my, my executive team of uh, an internet billionaire who will remain nameless, who'd said he'd started his company with an O'Reilly book. And I said, yes, great, you know, he got billions and we got 30 bucks. Seems like a good trade, <laughs> you know, because we really like using the service that he built, you know, it's like, you know, we, we got 30 bucks, but we also got this amazing, uh, you know, service. So. Yeah. Well, it, it's so, fun. And, and anyway, then Brian Irwin, who was my VP of marketing, said, yeah, we create more value than we capture. And then we started making that as a, uh, a, uh, a motto. 
Something that I often think about O'Reilly, and there, there's some other organizations like this, but you know, we have the, the, the old story about the original California gold rush that uh, the ones that really got rich were the people that were selling picks and shovels. And you were, in a way, selling picks and shovels. And it's not that you got richer, but you're still here, and yeah. you're continuing to adapt. <laughs> and some of those people had, yeah. th they're doing well and not doing much and enjoying themselves, uh, uh, but, uh -huh. yeah. but it's not the but but it's 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 both a solid business. It's also continuing to ride the wave of what's coming next. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I think th there's a major element in the book, uh, and it's really shifted. We have a, a an early stage venture firm which is really focused on this. Uh, I really started to understand, and again, one of the chapters in the book is uh, is is called Super Money, and it's basically about the distortive effect of uh, stock options on the economy in, in ways that we don't see. Uh, you know, just as a for instance, you know, I mean, I, I get a dollar of profit in my company and I use it to grow the, to grow the business. You know, I have a business, I started with $500. Uh, I, every dollar that came in was from selling something to somebody who wanted it. You know, so it's, it's sort of an old fashioned company. You know, we, we uh, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the Adam Smith economy. Now, uh, you look at a lot of these Silicon Valley companies, they're basically giant bets, you know? Uh, and, and it's interesting because they're not all that way. You know, if you look at, say, Google, and you say, okay, I'm gonna just sum up all of Google's profits, and I'm gonna say, Larry and Sergey, you're owners of, you know, some particular share of Google, and you get to, you know, rake in your chips and take your share of their retained earnings, you know, they're still worth, you know, 30, 40 billion dollars, you know, because it's made a lot of money. So there's this bet and it paid off. But now look at Jeff Bezos. That bet is still running. You know, it's like the some, you know, if Jeff had his share of all of Amazon's accumulated profits, you know, he would not be worth a hundred billion dollars. Yeah, he's still, you know, because basically, you know, if you look at, at uh, you know, Amazon's price earnings ratio is something like 10 times Google's, you know? And it's just like, so this huge financial bubble. And the thing is, if we look at the, the real estate values in San Francisco, there's a lot of money that's coming out of nowhere. Every year, these companies are basically extracting vast amounts of capital from people who are basically playing the roulette game. And that money is flowing into the economy, but it's a very different kind of economy. And I think we need to understand that there's a set of, uh, like, uh, uh, of distortive factors in our economy that lead to inequality, and that we're not all playing the same game. And again, a lot of people in this room are probably part of that Silicon Valley economy. But when we look at the rest of the country and we wonder why they're so mad at the technology industry, you know, they're looking at us in the same way that we look back at Wall Street, which was doing, they had a funny money-making machine where they could basically crank out their own special kind of money called CDOs. We have a special kind of money called, you know, stock options in these, you know, speculative companies. And it's this sort of creator of enormous wealth, but it's paper wealth. And people are able to cash that out and raise, then it drives real estate prices, it drives everything. And, you know, it's not actually necessarily, again, back to maps, there's a map of the economy where we don't, people in this community don't understand how incredibly fortunate they are to be at this particular time when a lot of people are betting on the things that they're doing. And it's kind of interesting because, of course, all the, the cryptocurrency speculation is really making super clear just how bubblicious it is. <laughs> <laughs> So one last question for me, and then we'll get to, to, to your questions. Um, you know, when you were talking about this, and at the lower levels of this, you said, uh, we think in labels. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's interesting, and, and for, I think it's important for folks who haven't read the book or may not know, um, having kind of cast off the labels, if I understand correctly, to understand better what's going on, um, you brought labels back to certain moments in time. And so yeah. um, open source, Web 2.0, and the maker movement are all three examples of yeah. putting, putting a label, putting, collecting uh, a moment into something. 
Yeah. What, what are your thoughts about, I guess, the power of doing that? If they were called something different, would we have a different future if they hadn't been named at that time? How do you, how do you think about yeah. the, the power and the importance of, of, of putting a name? Well, the, the label is just shorthand. And, and so it's sort of interesting because with both open source and Web 2.0 and the maker movement, I actually didn't coin any of those terms. Uh, uh, open source was coined by Christine Peterson of the Foresight Institute, which is a nanotechnology think tank. Uh, Dale Doherty coined Web 2.0 and the maker movement. And Dale's uh, now the CEO of Maker Media, but uh, worked with, for me and with me for many, many years. Um, so I basically laid out kind of a map of the world and then and brought uh, the right people into the then, room. And then, and then the name arrived. You know, the right name arrived that caught the zeitgeist. And uh, you know, but but again, the 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 label is you know one level of of the map. But it's not the, the you know it's like if the map you know there were a lot of people who heard Web 2.0 and they they kind of made it mean something else. And I go well, the words do tend to run off with themselves, don't they? <laughs> All right, we've got a question in the back. To start us off. Hey there, Jim. Um, I'm curious uh, to hear your thoughts on um, society's ability to respond and, and handle and adapt to the increasing rate of change of technology or of the map. You know, it seems like yeah. it takes time for people to get comfortable with any change, and we're just increasing the pace of change. And yeah, I, I, are let we me getting better? I want to challenge you on that. Uh, you know, you hear that a lot, that the pace of change is, is faster. But I, I was looking recently at the distance between the first, uh, you know, uh, mechanical weaving machines, you know, the spinning jenny, and the fully integrated textile mills of the 1840s. It's about 80 years. And uh, then you look at what's the distance, how far are we from the first digital computers? 70 years. You know, it's like we think it's going faster. It's not going faster. You know, it really isn't. You know, and, and I certainly, you know, look back and you kind of imagine, uh, you know, the world of, you know, 1900 and the world of 1950 and the world of 1950 and the world of 2000. And I guarantee you that the world of 1900 and 1950 saw a lot more change than the world of 1950 to, to 2000 or 1970 to now. I just think it's just, it's, it, you know, we're, we're patting ourselves on the back and we're giving ourselves a pass for being such shitty responders to uh, you know, the challenges of our time. Yeah. And, uh, all right, right there and we'll get you next. So I'm a uh, retired early childhood educator, and I love the maker movement. I love maker ed. Uh, I've mm -hmm. been a hands-on play-based teacher for over 30 years. And um, I was just querying about what this next generation, and now the maker ed movement's been going on for, what, over a decade or so, mm -hmm. along with some early pioneers doing the hands-on play-based learning. What is this generation that's growing up with this kind of learning opportunity uh, what are we looking at in the future with them? I, I'm totally energi energized about it. You know, I, I am too, and I, I think, I, I do think that the, the, you know, it's not just maker ed, it's just project based. It's, uh, I think, uh, what uh, John Seeley Brown and John Hagel de described as the power of pull as a huge, uh, you know, factor. I mean, just the ability to have learning on demand. I mean, that's really what my company does on the professional side, but just, you look at, at YouTube. You know, I mean, I was talking with Hal Berry, and Google's chief economist, about that this morning. You know, just like the number of how-to videos, it's totally possible for people to say, I need to know how to do something. You know, we're moving toward that world that's a little bit like the Matrix, where Trinity says, I need to know how to fly a helicopter. You know, <laughs> you know remember that? But, you know, and there's this whole other side. Again, one of the things that I see that's such an important way to think about the future of learning is that we actually have interfaces that teach. 
you know, you think about, uh, you know, one of the things, one of the things I do, and I was going to spend some time, you know, I spent a lot of time in the book unpacking Uber and Lyft into, here's all the things that I see in there. I see augmented workers. I see the, you know, managed by algorithm. I see this network platform. But think about this augmented worker part of it. You, know, you can have this much greater supply of drivers because they don't have to know anything. The app knows it. They know how to. They have to know how to drive. But you know, it used to be that it took time. You know, the knowledge of the streets and monuments of London is one of the most difficult exams in the world. You know, it takes three, four, five years to master. It's like becoming a brain surgeon, for Christ's sake. You know, you literally become. If for those of you who are fans of Dune, you become a Mentat GPS, you know, yourself. The test is, you know, get from this random point in London to that random point in London, and you give turn-by-turn -turn directions. You know, it's like, that's a, a, you know, the brains of London taxi cab drivers used to change. You know, now it's just like you follow what the app tells you to do, right? And that actually is this incredible cognitive augmentation, I think, is the next stage. And, and we see it with kids. My stepdaughter, uh, you know, uh, just we had this uh, experience that I recount in the book where we were having a fancy dinner for a donor for my wife's nonprofit, Code for America. And her daughter was 13 at the time, said, well, can I make dessert? And we were like, well, I guess, you know, you don't want to say no, but you're a little bit, oh, my God, this is going to be, you know, a kid dessert, you know, and it could be a disaster. And in comes something that you would be amazed at getting at in, in a high-end restaurant. There's these th eggshell thin dark chocolate cups with ice cream and fruit in them. It was beautiful. I, and we're like, whoa, where do you get it? She says, well, you know, I, I, you know, I think she saw it on Instagram. And then she followed, got a YouTube video. And it was like you blow up a balloon and you form the chocolate on the, on the balloon. And you have to wash the balloon first. You know, she kind of had it all down. But it was just like she just taught herself on the fly to do this cool thing that she saw. And that's like what, you know, we need to teach kids and we need to give everybody the opportunity to do that on-demand learning. And that, of course, was at the heart of my business, you know, in building the, you know, the internet. It was like we produced that kind of content where people go, oh, I want to build a website. Well, how do you do that? Well, yeah, they would pull in the knowledge. It used to be books and now it's videos and, you know, but there's so much now that it's, it's learning on-demand and knowing that you can learn virtually anything. And then we have to figure out, well, what are the fundamentals that will allow somebody to get good at that and to have the confidence to do that? And then what are the fundamental structural things that will help them to you know, use, uh, particularly as you get into more advanced areas, uh, to be able to really grok it? Yeah, yeah. thanks, Tim. Hi. You mentioned, with respect to microbiomes, something to the effect that if the marketplace is out of whack, the organization, the organism won't live up to its potential. Yeah. How, where are today's internet companies out of whack? Well, the thing that I'm most concerned about is that there, there seems to be a pattern uh, which is and I think it's really driven by what I see as the master algorithm of our, our economy, which is you must keep growing. You know, for the financial markets, basically, it, the premium is growth. And so no matter how idealistic you are, if you're a public company, at some point, you have to keep growing because you pay your employees largely in stock. There's this hidden flow, you know, which, you know, you know see Mark Zuckerberg and Larry and Sergey have super voting stock. Oh, they have control. But no, they don't, because guess what? As soon as their growth slows, they can't hire the best people anymore, right? Because those people expect that stock to keep going up. And so there's this master algorithm in a financialized economy which says you must grow. And so what these companies do, they reach a natural plateau, and they can't just go on and go, wow, we're delivering this great service. You know, let's just keep doing it. No, they have to start eating their ecosystem, and that's what they do. That's what Microsoft did. It's what I see Google doing. One of the things <laughs> that, that I've been kind of noodling on, I, I haven't got to the bottom of because there may be other reasons for it, but I noticed in Google's financial statements that five years ago, 30% of their ad revenue came from other people's sites. In 2016, it was down to 
18%, you know, so because they're offering more and more of the content that used to come from other people's on the web uh, directly in their own apps. And I go, well, you know, that may be better for users, but it doesn't speak well for the long-term health of the ecosystem of the web. And when that goes, uh, you know, you know, do in, you know, does that, does that, you know, uh, you know, the whole thing fall down for Google, uh, just as it, or at least slow down. And so there's kind of an argument that I, I really try to make in the book from tech and the lessons of, say, Microsoft, you know, taking too much, uh, Google maybe taking too much, Facebook taking too much, and go, well, guess what? Look at our wider economy. You know, uh, it's become extractive. Uh, and there's this phase in economies where they're very inclusive and there's a lot of opportunity for everyone. And then uh, at some point, they become extractive. And as they become extractive, uh, they lose their vitality. And of course, this is the subject of, of uh, Duran Asimoglu and James Robinson's book, How Nations Fail. Uh, he talks about it in a macroeconomic perspective. So, uh, well, Ria gets the next question. Um, you, one of the fun, th in addition to poetry in this book, there's some sci-fi, and you just yeah. mentioned Dune in passing, so I've got to uh, draw out for a second. As for, for folks that don't know, uh, your first book was uh, a, a book about uh, and, and collaborating with uh, Well, there were two separate Herbert. books. Okay. I, I, uh, right out of college, I got asked to write a book uh, about Frank Herbert, uh, the author of Dune, for a collection of critical essays. Uh, it was a, a series of short monographs about science fiction and detective authors. And uh, I got to know Frank, and in the course of it, I did a number of interviews with him, and then I pitched the idea of a book of his essays and interviews, which I basically co-authored with him. And, uh, and that book is now up on, you, you put the book up now, right? Is yeah. that the one you put up on? Uh, yeah, the first one, not the second one. The second yeah. one was a collection of essays and interviews, and that was called The Maker of Dune. The first one is just called Frank Herbert, and it was published by a small publisher that eventually kind of got subsumed by someone else, and I tried to get back the rights because it was no longer available except on you know eBay or whatever, and there was nobody to be found. This is the, the Google Orphan Works issue, if you ever followed what happened with and I eventually said, well, screw it. I'm going to put it up. And I have a little disclaimer that says if, if you, know, you ever want to, it's a little bit like, you ever see Kill Bill? You know, it's like, uh, you know, if you grow up, you, you, know, you know where to find me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I kind of was like, OK, you know, Frederick Unger, if anybody who owns those rights ever, you know, uh, you know, wants to come complain that I put it up for free, you know where to find me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years on, no one showed up. So it's available for free. So, so <laughs> yeah, so so I, it's O'ReillyMedia.com slash Tim and the link. No, no, no Tim.O'Reilly.com is Tim my personal archive, and that's where the science fiction. Okay, Tim.O'Reilly.com. Um, what's your, what, what would you say the science fiction perspective? We're big believers here that science fiction is not just fun, it's telling us something about the future. How do you think about a science fiction thought, and, and, and has it, is it something that you, kind of apply, or did you learn anything from Frank Herbert? What would you say about the science fiction viewpoint and the real world? Uh, well, I guess I would just say that in general, the thing I probably took more from science fiction from anyone else than, than anything else was this idea that you could be a nerd and you could change the world. Yeah. You know? And, you know, here you know, it's like, you know, yeah, you know, and it's funny because actually that was the thing I loved the most about Star Wars where I went, George Lucas understood the soul of science fiction, at least as I experienced it. Like, you know, here you are, you're this kid in this, you know, back-ass place, you know, and you kind of think that there must be more to the world and that you can make a difference. And sure enough, it happens. You know, and then of course you think about Heinlein's have spacesuit, will travel, or, uh, you know, just all of those, you know, it's just some opportunity to, you know, make a difference. And that, to me, science fiction is this sense of hope and possibility and capability and the ability that we have to grow into that capability, uh, both as individuals and as a species. Got another one in the back there? Yeah. There we go. Hi, or, hi Tim. Uh, so I was wondering what you thought uh, the role of government is in driving future innovation, whether that be in 
uh, initial investment in new technologies or in setting up uh, good infrastructure for yeah. tech innovation to take place or in uh, yeah. just general education? Yeah. Uh, well, of like I would just say in general, one of the, the most serious bad maps that's out there right now is that government uh, you know, is this bad thing that's bad for the economy, let the business you know, just you know, go off and do its thing. Uh, you know, I remember when Barack Obama said, you know, you didn't build that and everybody gave him a hard time. You know, go, no, look around. You know, I didn't build that road. You know, I didn't, you know, uh, make sure that everybody in the country had power and telecommunications, you know, as opposed to only a few. I didn't, you know, there's all these things that we built. And there's a wonderful book that I highly recommend called The Entrepreneurial State by Mariana Mazzucato, uh, which basically you know, explodes that myth. It kind of looks, for example, at an iPhone and describes the you know, 20 or 30 key technologies that were funded by the government that made the iPhone possible. You know, everything from the fast Fourier transform. You know, it's just like, it's, you know, for signal processing, it's just like basic stuff, you know, the GPS, you know, the internet, uh, you know, the, 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 the bunch of the chips. You know, just so much of this stuff was there lying around for the taking because somebody invested in it. And, and, and uh, I think a lot of what, you know, think about, you know, what's happened with uh, the genome, you know, the Human Genome Project. And, and uh, uh, you know, we now, have, you know, anyway, I, I think the government investment, uh, you know, in common infrastructure is incredibly important. And, and actually, the thing that's really the, probably the biggest problem with government is it needs reinvention. And it's very hard to reinvent it. You know, I mean, I, I, the, the thing that's really good about markets is that the, the competition does force reinvention. And when you have a monopoly on certain kinds of power, uh, it's very hard to, to be reinvented. But it does happen. And there's, a, there's a, you know, I'm very involved with that sort of government reinvention movement. And I was just talking with Peter Schwartz today. Uh, he was telling me about uh, the, the uh, finance minister of New South Wales and Australia, who's just going all in on uh, you know, government reinvention and sounds like doing incredible work. And of course, the work that my wife does at Code for America, uh, working with a bunch of states on reinventing government programs is, is incredibly uh, effective and uh, making good things happen. So. And uh, Mariana Mazzucato spoke for us in the seminar series. So you can find okay. on longnow.org, you can find her talk, which is great as an entree to, to her work. We also had a speaker here in this series named Lewis Hyman, and that video is on uh, the Interval website, also on our podcast, both of them. Um, and he looked at the New Deal and how the government, yeah. during the time of the New Deal, invested in technology and helped to make those, those things there. So, so both of those are, are, uh, are, are, are useful. Um, uh, vectors on that that important topic. Um, it, so it's interesting. So the book, I think I counted 14 speakers in all uh, between the interval uh, series uh -huh. and the seminar series uh, that are at least referenced in your book. Several board members and 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 founders of this organization as well. Um, and of course, you've got two seminar speakers in your family. So uh, with yeah. uh, with with Jen and Saul, your son-in-law. So. Yeah. Um, at the end of, uh, towards the end of the book, um, one of your sort of summing up points, you actually talk about the very first Long Now seminar, which was the Brian Eno talk, mm -hmm. just, uh, just yeah. in the other building right here on yeah. at Fort Mason. Um, I wonder, as a, fav as a favor to us, uh, uh, what, what, can you recall anything about that evening? Do you remember, or, or do you remember how the, uh, the idea of uh, the long now, because he articulates it's, it's a talk yeah, about I, I the mean, big here in the long now. It's, yeah, I mean, I stole shamelessly from his talk. I'm sure that, that Stuart remembers it far better than I do. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't have anything particularly to add other than that, it, again, it was that wonderful uh, you know, uh, notion. The, the story, how many of you have, have know the story of how the long now we'll started? Give the, Actually, shall I read it? Uh, sure. Since I've got it in here somewhere? <laughs> um, I probably have it bookmarked. Um, I don't have it bookmarked, but I, I'll, I'll find it by looking in this clever thing here we called go. an index. It's 355. Yeah, I just, <laughs> I just found that. Uh, um, but I, 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 I loved it uh, how, how uh, so um, 
the musician Brian Eno tells a story about the experience that led him to conceive of the ideas that evolved into the Long Now Foundation, a group that works to encourage long-term thinking. In 1978, Brian was invited to a rich acquaintance's housewarming party. And as the neighborhood his cab drove through became dingier and dingier, he began to wonder if he was in the right place. Quote, finally, the cab driver stopped at the doorway of a gloomy, unwelcoming industrial building, he writes. Two winos were crumpled on the steps, oblivious. There was no other sign of life in the whole street. But he was at the right address, and when he stepped out on the top floor, he discovered a multi-million dollar palace. I just didn't understand, he explains. Why would anyone spend so much money building a place like that in a neighborhood like this? Later, I got into conversation with the hostess. Do you like it here? I asked. It's the best place I've ever lived, she replied. But I mean, you know, is it an interesting neighborhood? Oh, the neighborhood. Well, that's outside, she laughed. <laughs> In the talk many years ago where I first heard him tell this story, Brian went on to describe the friend's apartment, the space she controlled, as the small here, and the space outside, full of winos and derelicts, as the big here. He went on from there, along with others, to come up with the analogous concept of the long now. We need to think about the long now and the big here, or one day our society will enjoy neither. <laughs> well, so I, I guess I would just say uh, I have uh, a, an enormous debt to this intellectual tradition. I, I think uh, Stuart knows this, uh, uh, the rest of you don't. Uh, when I was, you know, uh, you know in, in college, you know, I, I desperately wanted to be published in, in Coevolution Quarterly, and I, I sent off numerous pieces. I actually had one accepted but never published. But it was the first place uh, that I looked to, you know, it was sort of aspirational for me uh, to be, uh, you know, part of this world. So. I was always really glad when I eventually got to be part of this world. <laughs> well, thank and you. I just want, I'm just, you know, uh, I, am, I am very grateful to uh, Stuart and uh, Lawrence and, you know, all of you all who, who built this kind of intellectual heritage. It really is a real gift to the world. So thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> so. I know there are a lot more questions. You're going to stick around. Yeah. Uh, you're going to be signing books. But please, uh, you can get books in the back. You can come up here and get your book signed or, or talk with him. And uh, please stick around and, and uh, keep the conversation going. Um, Tim, I have a Long Now Challenge coin oh, to wow. thank you for, awesome. for, uh, for, for speaking. And yeah. uh, just really great. Really enjoyed well, the book. And thank you, uh, everybody. Please stick around. Let's give one more big round of applause for Tim. <laughs>